hard to pinpoint exactly when our most current era of racial reckoning and backlash to that reckoning began. It's a perennial feature of American life since the dawn of the country. But I would say the events of 2014 were a pretty big part of it. You might remember that's the year that a police officer shot and killed 18-year-old Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. That shooting resulted in huge protests in that city, but also across the country. And, and those protests was part of what inspired the then quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers, Colin Kaepernick, to remain seated during the national anthem during the 2016 preseason. He explained, quote, I'm not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. To me, this is bigger than football, and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. There are bodies in the street, people getting paid leave and getting away with murder. Kaepernick started getting bat backlash for sitting, including from a former NFL player named Nate Boyer, who also serves as a Green Beret. Kaepernick reached out to him, and Boyer suggested taking a knee instead of sitting. In my opinion and in my experience, kneeling has never been in our history really seen as a disrespectful act. I mean, people kneel when they get knighted. You kneel to propose to your wife and you take a knee to pray. And soldiers often take a knee in front of a fallen brother's grave to pay respects. So I thought if anything besides standing, that was the most respectful. But of course, that's just my opinion. Out of that, uh, Kaepernick started kneeling. The practice was quickly adopted by other players in the league and became a point of grievance, famously, for presidential candidate Donald Trump, among many others. Kaepernick will not play again after the end of the 2016 season. He filed a grievance claiming the league was shutting him out. Now Netflix limited series Con in Black and White, helmed by award-winning filmmaker Ava DuVernay, explores Kaepernick's early life through dramatization and Kaepernick's own narration. Growing up with white parents, I assumed their privilege was mine. You too good? Okay. Fine, thanks. Yeah, I'm good too. Thanks. I was in for a rude awakening. We going out to black. What's up with Kaepernick? The hair. Something climbing out the back of his head. Not acceptable. You're just gonna have to prove him wrong. Why am I always the one that has to prove them wrong? Nobody thought I tell the truth, I know what's facts. Sometimes I just feel uncomfortable. Chin up, Colin. I couldn't rebel because I didn't know how. But now, trust your power. Black is beautiful. Love your blackness. You will know who you are. Ava DuVernay directed the first episode along with all the present day scenes with Colin Kaepernick. She also has a new dramatic series, Queen Sugar on the OWN Network, and Ava DuVernay joins me now. It's great to have you here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, it's, a, it's such a uh, fascinating and novel kind of way of doing this project. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was great because I've been wanting to hear from him mm -hmm. <laughs> on this for so long. Here's this person who, who did this, you know, remarkably seismic thing from a social perspective, yeah. has largely not given interviews. Like, how did the project come together to begin with? Yeah, well, I think it's in line with the way that he's been expressing himself, which is very selective, um, in some ways obscuring his main point um, purposely to let people kind of have a dialogue without mm. pushing his narrative. Uh, so in this, I think it's the reason why he purposely said, I want this to be in my early life. I don't want to speak directly to what's happening right now. Um, but let's talk about the early life and the foundation of where this all started. And when we first, when he first approached me about it, I wasn't sure there was something I was interested in. It, it, what, do, what do I do with a famous person's childhood story? That's kind of, kind of not my thing. Right. Um, but, uh, but as I start to hear his story, and all the microaggressions and all the little things that make up someone who would eventually become an American icon, a singular figure in American culture. Um, it became really fascinating to me to use his life as a springboard into larger conversations about race, caste, class, identity, representation, all that good stuff. And so we collaborated in that way, and through that, he was able to speak and express himself. As we showed in that uh, little clip, I mean, he uh, is, has white parents. He's growing up in a, a, a universe. Adopted parents. Oh, adopted parents, mm -hmm. yes. Um, uh, a universe that's predominantly white yeah. um, and is kind of working through what his own identity is. Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of get a sense of this, this incredible arc of this person who's sort of been on this journey 
um, for a very young age. It's remarkable to think where he started and where he is now. Like, how did that boy, yes. um, you know, a, a biracial kid adopted by white parents, move from Wisconsin, dairy country, to Turlock, California, dairy country, predominantly white, three-sport athlete, um, always kind of, uh, and when you say three-sport athlete, that's something to be said, that someone who's following the rules and staying within an institution, three different ones at a high level. And that, when you're that, when you're competing at the level he was competing at, that's all you're doing. That's all I mean, doing. there's no time, like, no. A athletics at that level, at the level that he was, which we should say he's an incredible athlete. Incredible. <laughs> Three sports yes. at that high level. That is a kind of training, a kind of aptitude for, um, you know, staying in the lines. That's what we teach our athletes to be, right, in these American sports institutions. For that, for someone to break out of that into what he's doing now is remarkable, and that's what this, this interrogates. Well, and that point, I think, you know, the, the context specifically of football. I mean, yeah. we just saw, you know, these John Gruden emails came out and he's, um, you know, saying all kinds of bigoted things about all kinds of different groups of people. Um, there's a quote particularly about Kaepernick that they should, you know, cut this uh, F word. Um, there's a sense in which that culture particularly, I mean, even of all the major sports mm -hmm. cultures, yeah. is, is one of the most, I think, freighted with like machismo, reactionary instincts, kind of... Yeah, um, straight up racism. Straight up yeah. racism, straight exactly. Up. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so he's so steeped in that. And, you know, so that, it just makes... I, I feel like this piece in laying the foundation of who he is before he even gets to the point where he breaks out of that. I mean, this doesn't even get into the NFL. It doesn't get into, you know, college football. This is starting with the very formative early years where you are becoming who you will be. And that for many people of color, people who are outside of the box or outside the dominant culture, these little microaggressions, these little things that just feel like paper cuts, um, are loom as large in, in, the, in the formation and construction of who we are as, you know, larger societal yeah. institutional issues and so i think for me as someone who's often you know analyzing and interrogating race and in, in, in class and my work the idea that we can look at the small infractions mm. right and to see uh, how much that is molding us to become who we are um, became really interesting to me